Hello. 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 <laughs> Yay. It's the final session of the conference. Well done for getting this far. Um, my name is Simon Wardley. I'm going to talk to you about crossing the river by feeling the stones. A um, couple of warnings uh, before I start. I'm going to go through an awful lot, and we've only got an hour. Uh, so I've done a quick graph. Uh, level of audience pain, that's you, against the number of slides given in an hour's presentation. Uh, there's a safe limit of around about 40. Um, since, since I like to experiment, I'll be using 362. <laughs> um, so this is going to go really, really quickly. Um, so, so if that won't run away, OK? Um, the other thing is I'm going to talk about strategy. So um, I don't like the subject much. I normally expect these people sort of to turn up and tell me, you know, agile, all the things, or whatever's popular. Uh, uh, these people, I mean consultants. Um, so things like, you know, IoT everything, uh, AI everything, etc. Or my favorite is earlobes everything. Uh, this is from the Harvard Business Review, uh, November 2011, how earlobes can signify leadership potential. It's a phrenology of management, so it's really important for executives to have the right size earlobes. So I'm going to talk about strategy from my own personal perspective. Uh, when I was CEO of a software company called uh, Fatango, we'd been bought out by uh, Canon. Uh, we built a number of different services, online photo services, several million users, etc. Uh, we were doing fine, revenue all good, uh, we were profitable, uh, but we had a problem. And the problem was me, um, because rather than being a chess master of strategy like CEO, I was making it up as I went along. I was a fake CEO. Uh, it was all sort of like, um, well, I had all those things like vision statements. Our strategy is customer focus. We will lead an innovative effort of the market through our use of uh, agile techniques and open source. And, you know, that sounded good, except for I'd pinched it from someone else because I really had no clue what I was doing. Um, but what I did do is I used to go around listening to other CEOs talk about strategy, and I started to record the words they said, looking for what I call business-level abstractions of a healthy strategy, or, or blahs for short. Um, and I do this every couple of years, and th this is my recent set of common blahs that people talk about. Uh, things like digital business, big data, disruptive, innovative, collaborative, competitive advantage, ecosystem, open source, etc., etc. And then what I normally do is get all these strategy documents, pile them together, and, and generate a blah template. Uh, our strategy is blah, we will lead a blah effort of the market through our use of blah and blah to build a blah. And then I combine the blahs and the blah template and also generate a whole bunch of different strategies at random. So I thought I'd go through some. Uh, strategy number one, total random gibberish. Uh, our strategy is customer focused. Uh, we will lead a disruptive effort of the market through our use of innovative social media and big data to build a collaborative cloud-based ecosystem. Uh, strategy two, again, total gibberish. Our strategy is innovative digital business. We will lead a growth effort of the market through our use of customer focus, competitive advantage. Oh, you, you get the thing. And, and then I send them around to people, and I normally get responses of three basic types. Uh, this is more or less the exact wording from our business plan. I've seen two of these used already, and my favorite is are you for hire? <laughs> So, so, by the way, a friend of mine's put this all online. This is strategy as a service. Um, <laughs> so if you ever need a strategy, just type in the URL. Uh, this is one I did earlier. Well, I did it yesterday. Uh, you just type in the URL. If you don't like it, just press refresh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> our strategy is collaborative. We will lead an open effort to the market through our use of big data and social media. Anyway, so um, there I was in 2005, CEO of this company, not knowing a clue what I was doing. Um, I was like, oh, oh dear, what shall I do? So I went back to, to basics. Uh, Sun Tzu. Anybody know what Sun Tzu wrote? 
Art of War, fantastic. So Sun Tzu talked about five factors that mattered in competition. One, understand your purpose, your moral imperative. Two, understand the landscape that you're competing in. Three, the climactic patterns that impact that landscape. Four, your doctrine. And then you're into leadership, which is context-specific gameplay. Uh, then I came across uh, John Boyd. Anybody know what John Boyd wrote? Uda, Uda Loops, a US Air Force pilot. So John talked about you have the game. The first thing you do is observe the environment. So that's the landscape and the climatic patterns. You orientate around the game. And then, then you decide what you're going to do. That's the context-specific play. And then you act. Now, often people will say, well, strategy is all about the importance of why. Well, that, that, that's fair enough. But there are two whys. There's the why of purpose as in I want to be the best online photo service, and the why of movement, as in why do I make this move over that move. So if you think about a game of chess, you've got the why of purpose, which is to win the game, and then you've got why of movement. Should I move that piece, or should I move that piece? And it's through movement that we do learning. So we move that piece, it gives us a tiny bit of advantage, not much of a great deal, but if we move that piece, checkmate, you see? So, so much better. So if I go back to Fatango, um, I had my purpose, uh, online photo service. Here we are, 2005, very profitable. Um, the next bit is, how do I understand the landscape? How do I observe the environment? This led me into a topic known as situational awareness. And to explain this, um, I'm going to use three examples, uh, Vikings, Chess, and Themistocles. So Vikings, a very fearsome race. Um, the way Vikings uh, did navigation is they used stories. So things like, from uh, Herman, head due west towards half, and you will have sailed north of Hatland so that you just glimpse it in clear weather. That actually is just that, a yeah, much, much simpler translation. But the question I have to you is, what would you use to navigate? A visual map or a verbal story? What do you think? Map, story, story, story. Yeah, map, map. Okay, what do we use in business? Story. story, super, right, excellent. So the next example is chess world. I want you to imagine you live in a world where everybody plays chess, but no one's ever seen the board. All you've ever seen are these characters on a screen. And you play the game very simply. Uh, you press a button, uh, your opponent counters. Uh, you press a button, uh, they counter. And, and the game goes on for ages until somebody wins or it's a draw. Now, what will happen is people will take these sequences of many games and feed them into their, I don't know, big data systems and come up with magic secrets of success. So if you press queen, I should respond with king pawn or whatever. And, and we'll write articles about that, a bit like earlobes. Then what will happen is you will play a game of chess against somebody who will see something truly magical, uh, the board, but you won't know this. And so you'll, you'll press a piece, and they'll counter, and you'll press a piece, and they'll counter, and you'll have lost. And you'll first, you know, you'll be there, what the fiddlesticks happened there? I mean, all right, the first thing you're going to do is scribble down that sequence as though it's some sort of magic sequence which you're going to try and use yourself and you'll still lose. And then you'll start thinking, well, maybe it's the speed at which they press the button. Then you'll start going, is it cultural? They're a sort of happy sort of person. Maybe that's why they beat me. Um, they beat you because you exist in a low-level situational awareness environment. So what would you use to learn, by the way? Secrets of success or context-specific gameplay? What do you think? Excellent. What do you think we use in business? Secrets of success. Excellent. Super. Right. So the next example is Themistocles, uh, ancient politician, Greek general. Had a problem. The Persians were invading. Had choices. Defend around Athens. Defend around Thebes. Uh, what he decided to do was to block off the Straits of Artemisium, force the Persians along the coastal road into Thermopylae, narrow pass, small number of troops defend against a larger force. So about 170,000 Persians, uh, 4,000 Greeks, including 300 Spartans. Fabulous. 
So I want you to imagine you're a member of the Athenian army, so part of the Greek states. It's the eve of battle. Themistocles is in front of you. He's giving you purpose, a moral imperative. We must defeat the Persians. And then he says to you, I don't understand the landscape. I don't understand the environment. I have no map. But have no fear, for I have created a SWOT diagram. <laughs> Strengths. A well-trained Spartan army, a high level of motivation not to become a Persian slave. Weaknesses, the ephors might stop the Persians, uh, Spartans turning up. Sorry, a truckload of Persians are turning up. Opportunities, get rid of the Persians, get rid of the Spartans. We're Athenian, we actually hate the Spartans. Threats, the Persians get rid of us, and the oracle says a really dodgy film might be produced a few thousand years later. Okay, so what would you use to communicate and determine strategy in battle? Uh, position and movement described by a map or some sort of magic framework. What would you use in business? <laughs> Excellent, super, right, you're getting the point. So uh, here I've got chess, here I've got alchemy, navigation, learning, and strategy. In chess, it's all visual, context specific. It's all about position and movement. It's what we call a high-level situational awareness environment, a bit like the military. If you ask a general, why did you bomb the hill? They won't say, because I read an article in General Weekly that 67% of generals bombard hills. They, 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 they won't tell you, because it would make a good story, or, and, or that's what Uber would do. Um, but over here, this is alchemy. This is all about storytelling, secrets of success, magic frameworks. It's all low-level situational awareness environment. And so that's where I was as the fake CEO, desperately hoping that no one would rumble that I didn't know what on earth I was doing about, talking about. So anyway, um, I explained this to a couple of my peers, and they said, oh, don't worry, it's all about execution. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Because uh, that's one of those memes, I'd rather have a first-rate execution and a second-rate strategy. I, I, I tend to like data, though. So I went around looking, uh, I took 160 Silicon Valley companies, looked at their level of strategic play, situational awareness from low to high, and their use of open, as in open source, open data, open APIs, as ways of manipulating the market. The bigger the bubbles, the more companies in that group. Now, if execution ruled, these would be doing well. Uh, if strategy ruled, those would be doing well. And that's what it actually looks like. Uh, market cap changes over a seven-year period, positive and more negative. So it turns out that you know, both are important. Uh, you know, um, strategy is actually, actually matters. Um, so Demon's Doctrine, um, as uh, Professor Martin said, is about as flawed as it is popular, which is a bit of a shame. So I would explain that to people, and they would go, but we're successful getting uh, sort of my fat cat getting a little bit angry here, um, uh, which is fair enough, you know, if you're fighting against others, it's okay to be hopeless at this stuff as long as everybody else is, because then no one gains an advantage. And there's this wonderful study by Fitzer, uh, Use of Variance Decomposition, the Investigation of CEO Impacts, which basically says there's no different from random chance. So you can just get someone off the street. Uh, at which point, um, people get really angry at me. You know, we're not stupid. Well, that's fair enough, but I mean, there is a difference. You don't have to be daft to be blind. So the Vikings themselves, you know, they didn't see the environment. They, they had stories, it was their way of communication. They didn't use maps at all. It doesn't mean they were dark. And the difference turns out to be maps. But what do we mean by maps? Well, maps have certain characteristics that are really important. Um, they are visual, context-specific, battle at hand. Uh, you have the position of pieces relative to some sort of anchor, in this case, a compass, uh, and you can see consistent movement. And obviously, you have components. It's the same with the chessboard. Visual, context-specific, uh, you have position of pieces relative to an anchor, the anchor being the board itself, uh, and you have movement. And that's what a map has. So what did I have in business? Well, I had systems diagrams, uh, network topologies, which are not maps. Uh, they don't have those navigation characteristics. Or I had things like this, business process maps, 
which turn out not to be maps either. In fact, I had loads of diagrams which called themselves maps and didn't have any of the characteristics of a map. So that was my problem, 2005. How do I create a map? So I took one of my network topology diagrams and said, right, I need an anchor. We're going to have to start somewhere. So I took the customer and the user need. That was my anchor at the very top. Great. Now I need position. Well, I had lots of components which were basically in a chain of needs. So things like the customer wanted print, print needed a website, website needed a platform, platform needed compute, compute needed power. So I could create a chain of needs. Now I've got position and an anchor. Good. But I still have no movement. And that's a problem, because if you look at somebody like Nokia, it was a paper mill, plastics manufacturer, telecommunications company, something else today, it's changing. So I need to describe movement. So I took power. I thought, well, power. We start off with the Parthian battery, 400 AD. Somehow, we end up with utility provision, 1886, Westinghouse, Tesla. So how do we go from there to there? My first idea was uh, diffusion curves, um, Everett Rogers' work, made famous by Jeffrey Moore. Have you heard of crossing the chasm? Yes? So adoption over time. Uh, Jeffrey Moore does it as the non-cumulative form. Everett Rogers, the original work, is the, uh, the S-curve shape. Uh, Jeffrey very valuably added this chasm, the thing you have to ju jump over, uh, from the early market to the mainstream market. And I thought, well, this is going to be simple, isn't it? Because uh, what I'm going to do is I'm probably going to get something up here, and we'll get custom-built examples, and pro probably products and commodity, and I just have to find the right percentages, and, oh, that's wonderful. That'll be easy. Except for, unfortunately, I like data. So I looked at things like, um, well, take this, the smartphone. Right, who thinks the smartphone is a commodity? Hands up. So there's quite a few of you who don't. Okay, uh, what percentage of people uh, in the US do you think have smartphones? 65, 70, 80, 90, okay, fine. Right, gold bars. Who thinks gold bars are a commodity? Is there somebody here who doesn't think a gold bar is a commodity? Okay, fine. What percentage of the population have gold bars? <laughs> All right, the problem is a whole bunch of stuff wasn't commodity when 70, 80% of the population had it, but a whole bunch of things were commodity when only 1% of the population had it. So I can't really use adoption as a measure of change. Turned out that things appeared and would evolve through multiple diffusion curves uh, over different time frames and different applicable markets. So I can't actually use adoption or time to measure change. So I was a bit stymied at that point. And then I noticed something. When looking back through the history of telephones, so this is multiple uh, diffusion of multiple improving forms of telephones, in the earliest stages, I noticed we wrote manuals like this. The telephone and how to use it, how to hold it, you know, how to speak into it, etc. And I thought, well, we don't do that anymore. And then I discovered things like this. The room is equipped with Edison electric light. Do not attempt to light with a match. Simply turn key on the oh, wall by the door. And so I started to look into publications. And what happens is something appears, and we have publications talking about the wonder of it, the wonder of radio. Then that gets overtaken by publications talking about how to build something. So building construction awareness, so how to build your own crystal radio set. Then that gets overtaken by publications which talk about operation, maintenance, and feature differentiation. And finally, you get publications which talk about use. So uh, things like uh, the wonder of radio, Crystal radio sets how to build one. My radio is better or worse than your radio, followed by here's the radio times, what's good, what's good on channel whatever at four o'clock. And so there was increasing certainty about the thing. 
So what I did was I took uh, this point where the publication types changed, went back and looked and found the applicable market, then measured ubiquity against the applicable market, against certainty, that point of stability, and discovered this pattern. So what happens is things appear, novel and new, the genesis of new acts, like the first ever telephone, the first computer, the Z3, 1943, the Parthian battery, then through demand and supply competition, it evolves, and you get custom-built examples. Then you get products, so computers, you got uh, things like uh, the IBM 650, improving products, rental services, Timshare, commodity hardware, and eventually utility services. And that is movement. So I was able to take my value chain, flatten that evolution curve at the bottom, add in movement, and suddenly I had a map. A quick recap. I started off as this fake CEO, no clue what I was doing because I hadn't gone to the right courses. No one had taught me how to do this stuff, so I had to invent my own way. Uh, I realized I was competing against others. I was completely blind, totally depending upon stories, secrets of success, and magic frameworks. So I thought, well, hang on a minute. I want to be over here. That means I need to understand, A, the fact that strategy is a cycle, that I need to observe the landscape, learn about climatic patterns, orientate around it, and then get into context-specific play, which means I need to first understand the landscape with a map. A map needs an anchor, so that was users and user needs. I need position relative to an anchor, so that's my value chain. I add in evolution, I now have a map. It is 2005, and I went to other people and said, look at this, isn't it exciting? And they went, so what? Well, now I have a map, I can start to observe climactic impacts. So these are the rules that influence the game. The first one I noticed was that everything evolves. Due to supply and demand competition, it's all moving from left to right. The next one is the characteristics change as it evolves. It starts off in this uncharted space where it's chaotic, uncertain, poorly understood, changing, different, exciting, and a source of future worth. And over an unknown amount of time, it becomes industrialized, ordered, standard, stable, measured, dull, boring. This is known as the Salomon and Story innovation paradox of 2002. So the next thing I noticed was that um, because characteristics change, there's no such thing as one-size-fits-all method. Uh, Agile in-house was very strong on the left, very weak on the right compared to things like Six Sigma, which was all about reducing deviation, and very weak in the middle compared to things like Lean, Lean Enterprise, because they're all focused on learning and reducing waste. So there's no such thing as one-size-fits-all, which was great because in 2002, oh, sorry, 2001, we'd gone all Agile, as in um, XP, uh, and then by about 2003, 2004, we were discovering it wasn't working everywhere. So now, we, 2005, we understood why. Uh, we also realized that our purchasing methods were not singular. We needed time material VC based here, outcome based here, cots and fixed, and unit utility. That's good. Then we learned another pattern. As things evolved, they became more efficient, like electricity, but that enables higher order systems to appear. Electricity enabling computing, radio, television. So if you think about nuts and bolts, it used to be a homemade cottage industry. Uh, then Maudsley introduced the screw cutting lathe. Suddenly you get an explosion in standard nuts and bolts and suddenly explosion in machinery. And those higher order systems create new sources of value and new sources of worth. So as electricity became a utility, enabled television, and television became a new industry. Of course, all this stuff is uncertain on the left. So you didn't know whether the box in the corner showing pictures was going to be the future success or whether it was the refrigeration blanket. Personally, I would have gone for the blanket, but it turned out to be the box. So things evolve, new things appear, they evolve, they enable new things appear, and so what you get is a line of the present and a constant sea of moving components. And then you learn more patterns, that we have inertia to change because of past success. So if you take somebody like Blockbuster Netflix, who was first with a website? Blockbuster, right, who was first with video ordering online? 
Bob Lester, yay. Who was first with uh, experimenting with streaming uh, video online? Blockbuster, yay! Who went bankrupt? <laughs> right, so anybody says, oh, you don't want to be uninnovative like Blockbuster. Um, well, actually, they, they pretty much out-innovated most people. Uh, their problem, do you know what their problem was? Late fees. Hence the stores, late fees. They were addicted to late fees. Uh, um, for those of you who don't remember, you would get a video, it's a cassette thing, which you'd get from the shop, go home, forget to take it back the next day and get charged a fortune. Um, so now we have some basic patterns. We can anticipate, communicate, and challenge. So I took my map of our online photo service. I knew that computing platform was evolving to a utility. I knew that we would have inertia to the change. I knew that this would enable higher order systems to appear, and that some of them were new sources of value or worth, and we would get a new line of the future. So there we were, sitting in the boardroom, I had IT, I had uh, business development, finance, operations, marketing. We're all sitting around discussing around a map how our world is changing. A bit like, you know, in the military, a uh, Marine needs to call in a, um, air support. Uh, they, they, use, they can use a map to do so. You don't phone up, oh, sorry, I'll call in on a radio and get somebody from a air support, the Air Force, who they turn around and say, do you know how to fly a jet? No, well, we can't support you then. But interestingly, we do that in business. You may have noticed everybody in IT thinks everybody else should learn IT, and everybody in finance thinks everybody else should learn finance. Um, so we didn't have that problem. That was nice. And then we learned about weak signals. So weak signals. Uh, friends of mine used to run a hedge fund. Greed is good, all that sort of stuff. Um, they wanted to use social networks to look at whether companies were possibly a thinking about acquiring others. And I explained that's not the way you do it, uh, because uh, CEOs don't tend to like each other on Facebook or whatever, uh, especially not prior to an acquisition. Uh, but what they do like is private jets, and the tailplane numbers are public, and so are the flight plans. So what you can do is just map the movement of all the private jets, looking for disturbances in the pattern. This was 2008. Um, they're very good at leaking information. They're like, oh, everything must be secret. We jump into our jet and we leak information because it's all public. Anyway, the point is you can use weak signals uh, with this stuff. So we knew compute would evolve to a utility. We knew people would have inertia. We knew that would enable higher order systems to appear. And this sort of change is known as a punctuated equilibrium. It's a nonlinear form of change. Now, this is part of a cycle known as peace, war, and wonder. It occurs at both a local and a macroeconomic scale. So what happens, you get big vendors in this space, whatever it happens to be. Uh, they all have inertia to change because of past success. New entrants, unencumbered by a pre-existing business model, move in, like a bookseller for hardware. Um, that causes an explosion of higher order systems, the wonder uh, out of which new industries form. And of course, all the, the people stuck behind the inertia barriers, they, they disappear off the cliff. Um, and, and this is, occurs at both a, a local and a macro scale. So we call, at the macro, we call them ages. So like age of electricity didn't start with the Parthian battery. It started with industrialization of electricity pre-existing at Tesla and Westinghouse. Uh, same as the mechanical age, uh, machine age, didn't start with the uh, formation of nuts and bolts. That was long before. Uh, it started with industrialization, that shift from product to more commodity. And the point about this is, this is the trigger, the shift from product to commodity. And that's based upon that evolution curve, which comes from this, which comes from those publication types. So you can actually use the publication types and variants within them as a weak signal for when these changes will occur. Uh, and that's the last time I, I did a weak sig signal analysis. It's 2014, so it's three years old. Um, and what you've got is like big data is just entering the war 2015, which basically means you've got loads of big data product vendors running around saying we're the future. You've got about 10 or 15 years before they're all disappearing. Uh, it's already moving into utility space. Uh, that's already happening. Uh, platform, we're in that space. Um, center as a service, uh, a bit further away. Um, but anyway, that comes from the data. And the point about this is you know that uh, uh, these points of industrialization are approaching so you can at least plan for it. So quick recap, um, I wanted to be over here, not over here. 
I hadn't done an MBA, so this is obviously the stuff they, they teach people at MBAs, so I, 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 but I had to invent it because uh, I couldn't afford an MBA. Uh, I started off with the strategy cycle, understand, uh, uh, observe your environment, um, landscape, climate, orientate with doctrine, then you're into leadership. It's a cycle, it's an iterative process. Key for this is understanding your landscape, your map, uh, that has some basic characteristics. Um, so you start with user needs, understand position, understand movement. And once you've got that, you can start to learn climatic patterns, like everything evolves, um, characteristics change, no one size fits all, efficiency enables innovation, higher order systems create new sources of value and worth, past success creates inertia, economy has cycles, and, and you get things like punctuated equilibriums. And that enables you to do amazing acts of fairly obvious prediction. Uh, this stuff is going to a utility, and it's going to enable other stuff to appear. OK. So now I get into doctrine. Um, because once you've learned uh, the map, and you start to learn climactic patterns, you start to find universal approaches. Uh, by universal, I mean they're useful everywhere. So things like if you're in a sort of military sort of campaign, you get things like flanking movements, which depend upon where your opponents are. But there's useful things like soldiers learning to shoot a rifle uh, before, before a, uh, a battle. It's not much use going, oh, we should flank the opponent. You better all run off and start learning how to shoot a rifle for the first time. Uh, there, there's universal stuff that happens before. So these are universally applicable principles regardless of context. So things like focus on user needs, turns out, is universally useful. Um, remove, uh, reduce duplication. One of the beauties about maps is if you share maps, so like immigration, borders, police, uh, UK government, you share maps between departments, you suddenly start discovering we're building the same things elsewhere. Um, now, I used to think that government was bad at duplication and waste. Uh, then I started looking at the private sector. Oh, it's amazing. So I thought really bad would be having six examples of the same system in an organization. No one would ever beat that. Then I found a national bank with 14 CRM systems. Uh, European corporate, 22 rules engines. I, I had 118 workflow systems registering prisoners into prisons. We had to do it 118 times. Uh, then I found a global technology vendor, 170 cloud projects all doing the same thing. A global pharma company, uh, 300 separate teams all building enterprise content management systems and five global efforts, none of which knew the others existed. Uh, global Energy Company, 380 teams building customized versions of the same ERP system. Uh, and then I, um, I found a bank with 1,000 risk management systems. And they're all sitting there going, we can't innovate. And you just go, I think I know why. <laughs> anyway, so um, if I take something like HS2, heavy engineering, high-speed rail, uh, we used to try and organize things with box and wire diagrams. Uh, this is actually a map of them building the entire railway in a virtual world, because it, it, it actually much more sensible to dig up a virtual world and go, whoops, we got it wrong, than the, the real world. Um, but you've got a map, and, and now what they're doing is, OK, we check, what, have we got systems elsewhere? Are we using the right sort of method? So we're going to outsource that stuff on the right, build off-the-shelf product. Oh, sorry, yeah, use off-the-shelf products in the middle, uh, build agile in-house techniques on the left. So this is 2011, 2012. Uh, point is, we started using now multiple methods. Uh, that's another form of uh, doctrine, using appropriate methods. Now, in the past, we'd do things like take a topographical, sorry, a, a, a box and wire, a, a network topology diagram, and go and ask things like, should we outsource this without a map? And we'd make a decision. And of course, if you map that version, what you find is that some bits are actually suitable for mapping, for outsourcing, I should say, and some bits are on the left hand side are novel and new. So you wouldn't outsource them. If you do, you'll just uh, incur excessive change control costs because they will change all the time. So you don't take a whole bunch of things like this, get a big specification to outsource, um, because you'll just end up with huge overruns. Uh, but that's what we'd done in the past. And then we'd have fights with the vendors. And then somebody, some Muppet, would come up with the, well, we need better specification in the future. Well, that's never, ever going to work. So to give you an example of this, 
I thought I'd do an experiment. Do you know what a world perception server is? No? OK. Uh, so it's part of a self-driving car. And what I've done is I've translated uh, the, the network topology diagram all into Elvish. So I'm going to pretend you're all finance, and, and IT is all Elvish to finance people. And so here is the network diagram in Elvish. And so I'm going to say, uh, should we outsource or build our own A? Should we outsource or build our own B? What do you think? This is the sort of decision processes that we go through. Anybody? OK, so what I'm now going to do is I'm going to convert it into a map, exactly the same diagram, but it's now a map. Should we outsource or build our own A? OK, wow. What about B? Fantastic. And of course, now translated back into English, GPS, and World Perception Server. But the point is, we make these decisions about outsourcing contracts, not using, well, using those sort of box and wires. Anyway, so you get to the point of now you're using appropriate methods, and then we get onto things like FIST, fast and expensive, simple and tiny, US Air Force, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dan Ward. It's an approach of breaking down large complex systems into small pieces. It's used by Special Operations Command. So what, we, what you do is you've got your map, you're using the right methods, and now you think small. You build in small teams. So Amazon now calls that two pizza. Hire has its own cell-based structure. It's the same thing. And then what you discover is that attitudes are different. So engineering over here is not the same as engineering over here, and it's not the same as engineering in the middle. Same with finance and marketing. So you start building structures which cope with um, evolving attitudes. So you have pioneers, settlers, and town planners. And you create from that structures which are constantly evolving, cell-based, considering attitude. And we don't have time to go through that. But GCHQ, that's our intelligence services, very kindly open source boiling frogs, uh, which is a document which talks about how you, you structure around constant change. OK, so quick recap. Um, strategy cycle. Purpose, landscape, climate, doctrine, leadership, very basic, very simple. It's iterative. It's all about the why of purpose and the why of movement. So observe your environment, then orientate and decide and act. To start with, you need to have a, a map. A map has a number of basic characteristics, context-specific, position, anchor, and movement. Once you've got that, you can start to learn climactic patterns, things like everything evolves, characteristics change, no one size fits all. Um, efficiency enables innovation. Higher order systems create new sources of worth. Uh, that we have inertia caused by past success. Economy has cycles. Uh, there are things called punctuated equilibriums. In fact, what you discover, prepare yourself for horror, there are 27 different common economic patterns. And so you, you get to, it's like rules of the game, you get to learn these, and then you can more effectively anticipate, and you can. To take your map, you can describe the likely points of change. You can start using weak signals to refine on that. Then you get into doctrine. So we now have an idea of what's in our landscape, where it's going, so how do we organize ourselves. So you think about, well, we're going to focus on user needs. We're going to reduce duplication using multiple maps between different groups, use appropriate methods, think small, think aptitude and attitude, design for constant evolution. Prepare yourself for shock. There's about 40 common forms of universal doctrine, really useful stuff. Actually, this is quite useful looking at competitors because you get an idea of just how bad they are. To which people then go, ah, oh, this is complex. And it is. That's why we like stories. That's why we like secrets of success. That's like why we like magic frameworks. It is complex, I'm afraid. Uh, then we get into the leadership bit which is all about context-specific forms of gameplay. So you have your map. You can anticipate where things are going to go because you've got those climactic patterns. Not everything's perfect, but you can do a reasonable job. And now you're going, where do I attack? And this is the why of movement. Why here over there? Do I want to build the first platform, the first compute environment? Do I want to modify the online photo service? You also learn where not to attack, where to leave it, all the stuff stuck behind inertia barriers. And then you start to learn you can manipulate the environment. So you can use open approaches to accelerate. You can de uh, slow things down with fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Pattern plays. There's about four or five different forms of ecosystem models. There's all sorts of constraints that you can manipulate. 
horror, there's about 68 different ways of manipulating the market. It's great fun. And so you come up with a context-specific play. And that's what we did in um, uh, for Tango. 2005, uh, we used the map. We decided to build the world's first serverless environment platform as a service, or it was called Framework as a Service originally. Um, JavaScript front and back end, you build an entire application. It had functional billing. It was all based on uh, JavaScript operations, network, and storage. We anticipated somebody would play a... Uh, a utility compute environment. I actually thought it was going to be Google. Didn't realize it was going to be uh, Amazon the following year with EC2. Uh, we had a whole open play around it. And, and that's what we went and did, because the next thing is you act. So we built and launched Zimkey. And it grew like hotcakes. And we were like, oh, it's, it's, it's great. People building entire new applications in a day. Fabulous. Um, and then what happened is the parent company got some consultants in. And they basically said, uh, Oh, there are three things that we're doing. 3D printing, mobile phones as cameras, and this utility computing thing. That's not the future. The future is 3D TV. So shut it all down and spend a billion on 3D TV. By the way, who owns a 3D TV? Who uses mobile phone as a camera? Who uses cloud? 3D printers? I, I don't like American strategy consultancy firms. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, anyway, so I went to a company called Ubuntu. Heard of Ubuntu? Yay! So in 2008, I, uh, Mark's a friend of mine. We mapped out the environment, determined where to attack. I also mapped out Red Hat and, and Microsoft, and specifically with Red Hat, looked for points of inertia and how we could play the game against them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, particular things like whether salesmen had inertia to change and how we could exploit that. So we exploited that, and basically half a million uh, 18 months later, we went from 2% operating system market to 70% of cloud. Hey, that wasn't too bad. And then I went to government, uh, wrote something called the Better for Less. Uh, well, sorry, I, I worked for a research organization called the Leading Edge Forum, but I did a, a lot of work with uh, uh, Liam Maxwell and with government. And um, uh, this was for Francis Moore before the coalition got into power. Um, so that led to lots of things like spend control and changes in UK government. So quick summary, um, strategy is actually a cycle, not a linear path. It's an iterative process. It, it, it's like chess. Um, it's a game you have to learn. It takes time. It, it helps to understand the board. Uh, one of the key things is acting. Movement is the mechanism of learning. Um, really important to understand uh, the landscape as well, to observe it. So it's all about you know, uh, small steps, understanding the environment, uh, being adaptive, which is basically what crossing the river uh, by feeding the stones, uh, Din Xiaoping, is, is all about. Now, if you're all going, God, that mapping, oh, um, I don't understand any of it. Don't worry, it's all Creative Commons. Uh, you'll find uh, wardleymaps.com. Uh, um, I've got a Medium account. You can read all about it on there. Uh, and there's a group called Map Camp setting up to teach people how to map as well. Uh, and that's me. Thank you. OK, future things to think about. I had a charge for all of that, because I just wanted to get to this point. Um, so, so I assume, well, how many of you, actually, I should have asked that question. How many of you map? There's only a few of you. Hey, well, there's some of you anyway. So I, I, there's three other topics I can quickly cover. Uh, serverless ecosystem and MAGA. That, that's actually a spelling mistake. It should be MAGBA, make America Great Britain again. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, Oh, 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 quick questions. Do you want me to go through these? Yes? OK. So, uh, serverless and co-evolution. Right. Um, so a uh, platform, really interesting point of war. Again, 2014, we're in it. It's shifting into that utility space, code execution environments. Right. Let's wind back a little bit, talk about uh, infrastructure. So compute. When compute was a product, we built applications which used emerging architectural practices based upon compute as a product. And these are all based upon the idea of high MTTR. So I had a server, and if my server went bang, it would take me weeks to get a new one. So I had architectural practice like scale up, capacity planning, M plus one, um, uh, disaster recovery test. And, and do you all remember those? Yes, yes, great, super. And so they evolved and became sort of best practice 
um, applications built with best architectural practices for use as a server as a product, and we would go and mock people who didn't do capacity planning and all that sort of thing. Oh, you silly person, etc. cetera. Um, and then, of course, what happened is Compute Evolve became more of a utility, and so you've got a new set of emerging architectural practices based upon the characteristics which are low MTTR. So what happens is your server goes bang, it takes you seconds to recover. So you've now got things like distributed systems designed for failure chaos engines. And that sort of evolved and it's become good practice. And that's DevOps. And that's legacy. So when we talk about legacy, we're talking about applications built with best architectural practice for a product world. And that is legacy. Um, and DevOps is applications good architectural practice for a utility world. Okay. And of course, what happens is people go, make my legacy cloudy, i.e. they want to have all the benefits of you know, efficiency, agility, and all that sort of stuff. So I want to take that stuff, but I don't want to re-architect. And so somebody sticks their legacy on something like Amazon. Amazon has an outage, and they run around going, the end of cloud is nigh. Uh, to which you go, should now architecture evolve as well? And they go, burn him, evil, you know, get her, get her, a heretic, um, which, or whatever they say. Right, so um, the point is, it's those people there, best architectural practice, they have inertia to this change, and they don't like this, it's uncertain, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, so if you move up the stack into platform, uh, we, we've got this, this shift going on from uh, very much a product space, you know, I've got a LAMP stack or whatever it happens to be, uh, much more to a utility execution environment. I just write code, et cetera. Ideally, it's functions. And you'll get a co-evolution of practice. So a whole new set of new financial development practices will come out, uh, particularly things like functional billing. It changes the way you operate, how you invest in things, refactoring, all this sort of stuff. And that will spread. And so you should be investing in those two places. Of course, you're going to get resistance from you know, people, best architectural practice for how you build a LAMP stack or whatever, um, legacy environments. And you're also going to get resistance from the DevOps people because they're now below the line, so they don't matter as much. They're going to become sort of less visible. And then they're not going to like that. So they're all going to give you inertia. Okay, So you'll go out and say, how about no ops? And they're like, burn you, heretic, and all the rest of it. Oh, it's tough. That's the way it goes. Um, Ecosystem. So if you look at this game, uh, if you look at somebody like uh, Lambda, uh, of course, there's uh, Azure Functions and uh, Google Cloud Functions as well. Make some more noise for it, please. Um, <laughs> So if you look at somebody like Lambda, uh, Amazon's very good at a particular ecosystem. Well, it's very good at its ecosystems play. At this point, I have to be careful. I, I, because we cannot say how they play the game. But I'll show you an example of how you might play the game. So it's a gameplay called ILC, Innovate, Leverage, Commoditize. It's, um, oh, it's a decade old. It's 11 years old, this one. I know, because I wrote for, about it in Zimkey. It's very simple. You take an activity, you commoditize it to a component service, provide it as a utility. Um, everybody builds new things on top, componentization effects. They act as your free research and development department. Thank you very much. You mine metadata to identify new components, which you provide as utility services. Uh, the group over here grumble, oh, he's eating my business model. Uh, and that enables new higher order systems to appear, and everybody thinks you're brilliant. And so what you've got is Others innovating for you, that's your entire ecosystem. You're mining metadata to find future patterns, and you've got an ever growing platform of commodity services, um, which everybody's building on. So you normally show it in this form. Uh, you take something from the ecosystem, turn it into a utility service, expose an API, everybody builds on top, use that to identify new patterns by leveraging the data, metadata, consumption data, not their actual data, and then you use it to build new services. And the net result, it's very simple, again, it's a very old model, is your apparent rate of innovation, customer focus, and efficiency now all simultaneously increase with the size of the ecosystem. So. Do you know a company which seems to be getting more innovative, more efficient, and more customer focused every year, which other people say they've eaten my business model over? Anybody got any ideas who that might be? Right. So if you are that company and you're playing that utility game, then what's going to happen 
is, let us suppose, they're providing a code execution environment with all those benefits of functional billing, then certainly soon you're going to have a marketplace with uh, functions you can buy from others, a cPanel-like repository where you can get code functions from others, and suddenly you discover that the level of duplications in systems is nothing in comparison to the level of du duplication within systems, particularly within code. And you'll get into a world where suddenly everybody's building entire trading applications in a day and a half. I know, I built one in two days, but that was 2006. So um, that's the power of ecosystems. So really watch out. Be careful if you discover that somebody's playing a utility code execution game against you with functional billing and is very good at ecosystems, because that's a very dangerous uh, competitor and, and somebody you have to react to. Right, Magba. Do you want to hear about Magba? I've only got a few minutes left. Right, MAGA. Right, compared to what? Make America compa great again to compared to what? Um, OK, self-driving cars, because I, I like elves and self-driving cars. Um, I did a piece of work all years ago um, on um, the, the automotive industry. You start with consumers want to go from A to B. They want comfort, affordable. You've got a pipeline of cars. They also want status, because they want to look good in their car. And underneath that, you've got things like entertainment infrastructure entertainment systems, IS screens, location-based services, IoT, power supplies, assembly, sensors, oh, a whole bunch of things. Um, and what's interesting, of course, is that if you roll it forward, that's 2015, mm, 2014, but you roll it forward uh, to 225, you find it's a lot more commodity and all that sort of stuff. Very interesting. And you find new links, and what it basically means is we're heading into a world which is all, you know, much more self-driving cars, immersive. You won't own a car. You'll have a digital subscription. You might have gold. I might have silver, which means when I'm pottering along in my car, it will get out the way as you zoom past me and all that sort of stuff. Um, that's really exciting. Not really. I mean, it's all fairly obvious. Uh, from a government point of view, of course, it impacts things like driving licenses and all that. You have to think about that sort of stuff. But what's interesting is now if we start looking at the points of war, so these points of heavy industrialization, and then we start looking at which governments are good at investing as encouraging industries prior to those points of war, uh, you find China's brilliant at this stuff. It's gone really, really good. Um, so we all run around going, the future is Uber, Google, whatever, and within self-driving. Well, it may be, but actually more like Didi, et cetera. Um, so and there's some, you know, the problem with the whole make America great again, it's not really your choice alone. You are in competition with other nations. And if we start looking at the different value chains and gameplay that's going on, I, I mean, there's some real skilled gameplay. Um, you start going, well, actually, you know, there, there's some really fierce and capable and skilled competition. I mean, there's some truly amazing Chinese companies. Um, but anyway, people run around with it and say, you know, uh, we, 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 we've got to do this. And, and uh, so there's huge obstacles. And I, I've been trying to find what the biggest obstacle is. And it, it's, it's, I think it's economic thought, bizarrely enough. Um, I took about 160 old economists um, various people in the economic field, and, and ask them a bunch of questions. So US-centric people, so US-centric economists, I asked them on a scale of centrally planned to laissez-faire to place a bunch of economists. So they had Marx, Keynes, Smith, Hayek, Friedman. Okay? And they were like, this is the less effective communist model, this is the more effective capitalist model, and that's how they thought the US operates, very much Smith, Hayek, Freeman, and, and that's very much how China operates. I thought, well, that's interesting, because then I went and I kept within Western philosophy and I asked a bunch of European economists exactly the same question. And what we got is Marx here, Keynes, Smith, and Hayek in the middle, and Freeman right out on the right. And then so there, very much, this is sort of more of a social capitalist type model. Uh, and that's where the US is. And this is where China seems to be operating. And so you're talking Europe. Uh, and the impression is that China is actually operating as the world's largest venture capital firm. But of course, if you're talking to people in this sort of frame, that doesn't make any sense to them. 
So I think part of the, uh, part of the problem is, um, A, uh, it's a question of whether you understand uh, the, the actual landscapes that you're competing in, what patterns are actually play, but it's also the economic processes of thought. I mean, it's really difficult. You sit there with sort of um, US economists and say, no, no, it's a VC firm. They operate like the world's largest VC firm. They're incredibly skilled. And it's like people just have difficulty getting that. Anyway, it's, it's not a, a zero-sum game. Um, the, the one piece of advice I actually uh, would have is there's an awful lot of learning from China. There's some really skilled companies now who've extended beyond many of the management practices we, we have in the West. Anyway, so um, that was it. Thank you very much.